today's video is really going to be different. Um, we ran into a fella. His name is Durant Ashmore. He is uh, kind of a uh, um, historian in this area. Uh, not only that, but he also is a uh, his historical landmark preservationist. Uh, he'll actually preserve different historical sites. And uh, he actually sought us out. He wanted to tell us a little bit about some of the history of some of the places in our area, including some of the places we've hunted already. Uh, but one place in particular is some place I've heard about and I've never been to, and I've always wanted to see in person. Well, it just so happened he and his crew were preserving that particular landmark and he took us out and showed us around. So here's that video. Here we go. You know, in cedars like this and everything, of course these are pine, other pines, but um, we just opened up the, uh, the woods line a bit. These are the trenches right here. Right on through there. And through here. So, um, I'll be happy to to talk about this. Uh, tell, tell us what you know. Corey, hold off on the chainsaw for a little bit. So, um, here we are at the site of Fort Lindley. Uh, James Lindley was a Justice of the Peace of the 96th District. He was appointed a Justice of Peace in uh, 1772, and he moved down from North Carolina. He was granted 200 acres. So on his plat for the 200 acres, there's a spot that shows up as an old fort. There was a fort that was located right here, built for the first Cherokee Indian War from 1758 to 1761. This was a blockhouse or a fort for, that settlers came to for protection from the Cherokee Indians. So when Lindley came down, part of his um, land grant included this old <coughs> fort. Then um, when the Revolutionary War was uh, starting up, the fort was further fortified, uh, reinforced, and uh, made into a uh, defensive fortification for defense from the Cherokees, but also um, for either the Loyalist or the um, Patriot forces, because this fort did change hands. Now, James Lindley got involved with the capture of the um, powder that was intended for the Cherokees. He was with Patrick Cunningham, who um, uh, captured a wagon train of shot and powder, and Cunningham hid from the Patriot forces at the Cane Break on the Reedy River in southern Greenville County. And during the Battle of the Cane Break, uh, James Lindley was captured and he was marched down to Charleston during the snow campaign. It was a two, two week march. And when he got to Charleston, he was let go. And it's unclear whether he was actually paroled at that time or just let go because um, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, animosity early on during the Revolutionary War. And um, everybody was kind of trying to make nice so maybe he was just just let go but he, he was run out of his property he was run out of his house this fort that was here on his property was taken over by major jonathan downs who was the patriot leader of um the 96 militia and Jonathan Downs was a neighbor of James Lindley. Jonathan Downs lived just a few miles from here. So Lindley became a man without a home. Where does he go? 
he went to the Cherokee Territory, which is present-day uh, Greenville County. At that time, Greenville, Anderson, Oconee, and Pickens counties, it was illegal for uh, men of European descent to be in those counties. But he had nowhere else to go, so he went into the Cherokee um, uh, tribal lands. And he was there with a lot of other um, uh, Tories as well who were displaced from their homes. And he was there with hundreds of other men. And one of the primary gathering places for this group of men was the Richard Paris home, which is right now uh, at the falls of the Reedy River in downtown Greenville. Um, that was the first um, European settlement in Greenville County. And Paris was there illegally, but that's, that's another story. And Paris had a fort there as well. He had a blockhouse. And that was one of the places that James Lindley um, hung out. So in July of 1776, during the time that the Declaration of Independence was being signed, the British had um, a, an attack planned on Charleston by sea with their massive warships. And the only defense for Charleston was Fort Moultrie, an unfinished palmetto log fort. Um, and of course the British were defeated by that fort. Um, in, in, on Sullivan's Island uh, in Charleston. But at the same time, there was a coordinated attack with the Cherokees to attack the back country um, in conjunction with the British uh, Armada at Charleston. And the Cherokees were on the warpath. There were 60 settlers who were brutally killed and scalped at that time. Uh, so the settlers went to the blockhouses, and there was an entire series of blockhouses here in the back country. They were about every 20 miles apart. Fort Lindley was one of the blockhouses, and there would have been 40 or 50 settlers here seeking protection in Fort Lindley. Um, another blockhouse was at Kellett's blockhouse, about 20 miles from here. That was the closest uh, blockhouse to this area. So the only account, eyewitness account that we have of the Battle of Fort Lindley, which occurred on July the 15th, 1776, 11 days after the signing of the Declaration, the only first eyewitness account we have is from a fellow who was stationed at the Kellett Blockhouse. He, and this is during his pension application in 1832 when he's uh, applying to get you know, compensation um, for the service that he had in the Revolutionary War. And he was stationed at Kellett Blockhouse for 30 days. And his job while he was there was to bury murdered and scalped um, settlers along the coast, along this uh, area. 31 of them. He buried 31 men while he was stationed at the Kellett Blockhouse, which was only 20 miles from here. And he continues with his narration. He says, on the morning of July the 15th, we met a Tory who informed us that the Kellett Blockhouse was going to be, that the uh, Fort Lindley was going to be attacked that night. And I don't know what they did to that Tory to get him to divulge that information. But anyway, um, this fellow, I, I believe his name was William Brown, he says, we repaired immediately to warn the uh, defendants of Fort Lindley that a uh, Indian attack was, was underway, uh, going, to be, going to be occurring that night. So they covered the 20 uh, miles in, in rapid fashion and got here at dusk. And when they got here, there were settlers inside the fort. Jonathan Downs was here with his 150 men. Now, at the time, Fort Lindley would have been palisaded. Um, there were defensive trenches uh, in front of the palisades. The trenches are still visible to this day. Uh, Jonathan Downs' men would be camped out in the surrounding fields here. There would have been no vegetation within 200 
200 yards of this um, fort because that's the range of uh, the rifles that they were using back then. But Jonathan Downs' men were, were camped in the surrounding fields. And um, the uh, uh, rescuers from uh, Kellett Blockhouse came up and they may have been 50, they may have been 100 strong. And when they got here, Jonathan Downs' men out in the fields, they were drunk as drunk could be. They had been drinking rum all day long. They were so drunk that they leveled their rifles at the rescuers. So finally, Jonathan Downs got command of his troops. He stopped the rum. He brought everybody in to the fort. So now they have about 300 people in this fort. Fortunately, also at the same time, there was a group of militia from the Camden and Dutch Fork area coming through, 300 men strong. They were going to join Andrew Williamson and his attacks against the Cherokees. They stopped over here at Fort Lindley. So now we have 600 men inside this fort. One report says that the 300 camped a quarter mile away. Other reports says they were here. So, um, there are 600 defenders here at Fort Lindley. Well, at midnight of um, July the 15th, 1776, 300 Cherokee Indians and 300 Tories dressed as Cherokee Indians surrounded this fort, middle of the night. 600 defenders, 600 attackers. Shots ran out. They shot back and forth throughout the, throughout the night. Um, William Brown's account says that they charged out of the front gates of the fort, 10 abreast um, towards the Cherokees. Another account says that um, the uh, 300 men who were camped a quarter mile away came at that time and broke the Cherokee attack. And the Cherokees dispersed. Um, there were no Patriot uh, casualties. The uh, palisaded fort protected them. They found lots of Cherokee blood, but uh, they, they dragged their uh, casualties away. Whether there were any killed or not, we don't know. We do know that there, some were injured. So that attack was, was broken. Um, and the Cherokees retreated you know, during the night. The next morning, they formed a skirmish land that uh, left from Fort Lindley a, quarter, uh, a half mile wide and they marched um, over the, the field where the battle had occurred following where the Cherokees had retreated. And three miles away, they came to a clearing. And in that clearing, they found 30 horses with their saddles, their saddlebags, and um, the food that they'd been eating, parched corn. And they went through the saddlebags, and there they found the commission papers of Captain James Lindley. James Lindley led the attack on Fort Lindley, which was his home place. He attacked his own house unsuccessfully. He was also with David Fanning, who was another um, neighbor from around here. Um, Lindley left and went back into the Cherokee um, territory. Also, on the same day that Fort Lindley was attacked, a group of patriots from Spartanburg under Thomas Neal um, surrounded the Richard Paris home. And they um, took the possessions from the home, loaded three wagon loads of possessions, and burned the Richard Paris home to the ground on the same day that Fort Lindley was attacked. Um, we, we don't know what Lindley did for the next 18 months. He was probably living in Cherokee territory, minding his own business. Uh, when Savannah fell in uh, December of 1778 uh, and they started to uh, advance on Augusta and occupied Augusta in January of 1779. There was a uh, Tory resurgence and a Tory under the name of John Boyd um, gathered up six or seven hundred men from the back country of South Carolina and Western North Carolina and marched down to try to meet uh, with the British in Augusta. Well, they were stymied by uh, Andrew Pickens. 
Uh, Andrew Pickens with a force of 400 men defeated John Boyd's group of 600 men. John Boyd was killed during that battle. But during that battle, James Lindley was captured. And if he had given his parole in Charleston, and if he was captured, taking up arms again, that's a um, sentence of death. And James Lindley was sentenced to death, and he was hung by the neck um, in, uh, in 96. And uh, that was the end of James Lindley. And uh, his fort still has his name, but uh, that's, that's all there is as far as James Lindley is concerned. Very cool. Very all cool. That happened right here. I hope you enjoyed that video. This was a fascinating day for sure. And I certainly didn't wake up that morning expecting to uh, be standing at that particular location. I was excited, I was happy, I was uh, very thankful that Durant decided to seek us out and show us what he was doing. So, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed, until next time, we'll catch you later. Bye.